to reread something. I read this um, foreword of a book called The Only Planet of Choice last year in uh, July. I started it uh, through divination. I had had this book for 10 years and I then decided to record it live chapter by chapter and I've done all of this in German as well. And this morning I happened to just have a look at my downloads because I loaded them all onto my computer and when I was reading this foreword of this book, um, which was by uh, Sir John Whitmore, who is a party to this book and to the stories, um, it kept interrupting on the internet and I kept thinking, gosh, people will think I stopped reading. Anyway, so we're a year on and I've read all of it. I've missed it actually, I've really enjoyed reading aloud and translating it into German. But I thought I'm going to bring, I'm, I'm going to read the foreword again. Um, Sir John Whitmore, he was a racing driver. John Whitmore was born on the 16th of October 1937. He was a son of Sir Francis Whitmore and Ellis Johnson. And he passed away uh, on the 28th of April 2017. Uh, he was uh, very much involved with the, um, with channeling and uh, with the, uh, many ethereal and uh, metaphysical subjects. But uh, his uh, Wikipedia read uh, quite straightforward that he was a racing driver and uh, he, was di he died aged 79. Anyway, so we're now in 2021. It's the 1st of June today. And I thought I'm going to read the foreword again and I'm hoping it will get through smoothly. Foreword of the only planet of choice, essential briefing from deep space, a provocative and mind-opening experience. James Hurtak said that uh, for the, uh, speaking for the Academy for Future Science. We're in really amazing times at the moment and I'm reading this with pleasure. The search for extraterrestrial intelligence, SETI, is now a serious business. In 1992, NASA invested much effort money and new technology in searching the stars, or rather their planets, for radio signals which might indicate the presence of intelligent life forms. This book was published in 1993. On a recent British TV programme entitled E.T. Please Phone Home, Phone Earth, several eminent professors involved with the project expressed little doubt that such life exists and were anxious for Earth to keep listening for signs of it. However, they were not all in agreement about the wisdom of us Earthlings revealing our presence to the wider universe. As one luminary pointed out, we all know that we humans, what we humans did to societies that we deemed to be more primitive, primitive when we discovered them. So what might more advanced life forms do to us? That fear is based on the contradictory assumption that these advanced beings would be as aggressive, thoughtless, uncompassionate and primitive as human beings. It is too late now anyway, for we have been sending out signal radio messages for many de decades, the first of which have already sped past neighbouring solar systems. However, the bizarre nature of the more powerful signals that follow those first dots and dashes, from soap operas to evangelist preachers, might come as alien to wonder whether intelligent life does exist on Earth after all. When Mahatma Gandhi was asked what he thought about Western civilizations, he said it would be a good idea. Such might be the view of, of Earth from afar. The threat posed to us by travellers from other worlds, which was fostered by early science fiction books, Orson Welles' famous broadcasts and many films, is today reinforced by strange stories of cattle mutilations and UFO abductions. However, more recently perhaps, initiated by Gene Rodenberry's Star Trek, there have been several cinematic attempts to present extraterrestrial life as benign, culminating with Steven Spielberg's endearing E.T. In most science fiction stories, the beings, good or bad, are humanoid in appearance, but have the capacity to pass instantly through time and space. The cynic would dismiss both as convenient devices so to assist the storyteller to bring aliens down to Earth. Humanoid actors are certainly the easiest ones to come by, 
and we now know that in reality it would take ETs too long to travel here by conventional physical spacecraft. But can we be so sure that these fictions are not fact? Years ago, physicist John Wheeler postulated many interlocking universes, and other pioneers have gone past his limits of speculation to their limits of credibility. Other universes suggest other dimensions based on law beyond the comprehension of our scientists and beyond detection by our technology. Anything operating in this realm would appear to be magic to us and would of course be dismissed as an event or an illusion by those who hold tenaciously to the limitation of existing science. Only a century ago, were not electric light, radio, television and flight, let alone space flight, in the realms of magic to all but the foolheartedly? Are we foolhardy? Are we so arrogant and earth chauvinistic to think that our science, a mere hundred years on, is the only science of the universe? While Wheeler was theorizing about other realms, Yuri Geller was bending spoons by other means. Predictably, he was dismissed by defenders of the scientific faith, such as magician James Randi, Sati seeker Carl Sagan and science fiction maestro, maestro Isaac Asimov. Nevertheless, some reputable scientists validated his work and Geller himself went on to make a fortune locating oil and minerals for multinational commercial enterprises who were less sensitive about the scientific correctness of his powers. We find plenty of occurrences, occurrences that defy our scientific reason and religion. Of course, and they had strong symmetry with the types of events in which psychics like Geller engage. In our Bible alone, there are many examples of clairvoyance, clairaudience, channeling, telekinesis, hailing and dousing. It is profoundly illogical of us to accept our biblical stories on faith, and yet to deny that these things can or do occur today. The passage of time lionizes historical people and events in the same way as television does now making it hard for us to find a balanced perspective of distant times and to find their modern parallels. Of course, religion, at least the Christian the religion, has, less, has been overtaken by science as the guardian of the truth for us lesser mortals. We look to the high priests of science for knowledge and understanding. Robes have yielded to the white coat, the chalice to the test tube. Science has the advantage of not being obliged to define good or evil, though I believe we would all be better off if it was. At first glance, even on moral ground, science can make a good case for its ascendancy because the track record of religion is deplorable. Both in biblical times and today, examples of sheer evil carried out in the name of God and religion abound. From time to time, psychics too are revealed as frauds or use their powers for evil purposes. What is new, surprising or different? Wherever there is good, there is evil to oppose or distort it. Has not science created its monsters too? Of course, neither science nor religion are inherently evil, but what some people will do in the pursuit of them is horrendous. The Christian view of the coexistence of good and evil may not be too far off the mark, but people often find comfort in more one-sided interpretation of this concept, where extraterrestrials are concerned. While some defy and rush to embrace all forms of cosmic experience to help them escape our material existence, others see all alien acts or contracts as the work of the devil. However, it may, may not be that clear-cut. Is it not reasonable or to speculate that technologically advanced beings might exist in other dimensions? Beings who are not evil, but who regard us as a laboratory of lower life forms for them to experiment upon? We have few scruples about what we do to mundane animals in the interest of scientific advancement. Might they not do the same, hence the abduction and cattle mutilation? Some occurrences could easily lead us to believe that all extraterrestrial life forms are evil. Certainly they would, unless we are able to recognize how many different types of alien exist, and how many of them may be around us all the time. This idea directly challenges the scientists' notion of physical ETs developing along rare chance evolutionary parallels to ourselves on a few distant planets, but it readily fits with religious beliefs. Yes, beings of white light, dark forces and the greys in between could be here now, though for the most part in another dimension, undetectable to us. It is only our blind logic that asks 
Why don't they come and land on the White House lawn? Why don't they come and sort our mess? And the, uh, sort out the mess we're in? Why would they bother with a little planet like ours? It may be up to each of us individually to discover them for ourselves and make our own allegiances. Is that not what religion suggests? In our eagerness to embrace the wonders of science and acquire the new technological luxuries, we have elevated scientists to undeserved heights of infallibility and have not considered whether they are looking in the right place for extraterrestrial life. That life is here amongst us now and has been ever since that brief moment in universal time of what we call recorded history began. If angels and other cosmic beings exist in another dimension, I'm sure they would appear and disappear as if by magic. And is that not exactly what they did and do? Might they not come in chariots of the gods which would defy our laws of gravity and common sense the way that UFOs are reported to? If we read between the lines of religion and science fiction and look a little less to science for understanding of extraterrestrial intelligence, we might be more successful. I suggest that NASA array of radio telescopes cannot see the world, the wood for the trees. They are looking out there. It is right here. It is even willing to talk to us if we are willing to listen. Perhaps if we were to ask ETs about their existence and purpose, they might tell us and also spell out why they do not make their presence globally known. The problem is that religion invites us to talk to God and his cohorts, but if we dare to claim that they have answered us back, we are considered crazy. For nearly 20 years now, I have been talking with a group of beings, non-human and invisible, who have, with great love and patience, told me and several colleagues much about the structure of intelligent life forms in the universe, where Earth fits into the scheme, what our purpose is and that of our planet, how our misuse of religion and science has distorted our understanding to the point of blindness, and what we can do about it. My partners in this venture include Dr. Andre Japuharic, identified in the text as Andrew, other scientists, religionists, and Gene Rodenberry of Star Trek, who obtained a detailed description of beings from elsewhere in the universe. Gene and Andreja have passed on, but most of the others are still with us. The only planet of choice is a, is a selection of our conversations with our friends from space. I hope it will help to clear up, for some people at least, the huge gulf of understanding that divides religions from each other, religions from science and scientists from psychics. Sadly, we also have to contend with certain powerful earthly author authorities who have in their folly or wisdom, depending on your point of view, chosen to protect us by the judicious use of disinformation and ridicule from their more complete knowledge about extraterrestrial life. One wonders if they really know with which level of the cosmic hierarchy they are dealing and who needs protecting from whom. This book, along with other books, with crop circles, the new genre of sci-fi films, a few global crises, whistleblowers, paranormal events, controlled leaks and not-so-controlled ones, are all part of the essential awakening of Earth. The awakening demands that we move beyond the present structures of both science and religion. The challenge for science is that the essence of religion is true. The challenge for religion is that there is but one truth, and that any one religion possesses is a perspective of that truth. And all that any one of religion possesses is a perspective of that truth, and by now, a fairly distorted one of that. There is no authority for real understanding but ourselves. We need to be bold, but very discriminating. I don't expect that my particular logic expressed in these few pages will be sufficient fully to open the mind of the more skeptical reader. Some of us will not, without good reason, balk at any messages that purports to emanate from a cosmic source, especially if it is delivered by or transmitted through a fallible human being. We may shield ourselves from that which we do not understand or cannot believe, with the assumption or even the accusation of fraud. Fraud, however, only occurs when there is a perceived or actual pecuniary gain or power to be had. This is certainly not applicable to Phyllis. The role of a go-between on the surf, on the, at the interface between earthly and universal consciousness is fraught with difficulty, loneliness and stress, and is often both physically and emotionally painful. 
Phyllis has experienced that and more. She's an ordinary American lady, nutritionist, mother and grandmother with extraordinary gifts as a teacher, healer and channel, who tells about herself and how it all began in our own words in Briefing. To understand more about the channeling process, I recommend a reading of Briefing Part 2 before embarking on the main text. There will be those who reject channeling or have an unshakable aversion to it. I have a lot of empathy, empathy with that position myself, but we are dependent upon knowing the source of a message. But are we dependent upon knowing the source of a message in order to recognize or accept the wisdom contained therein? Does a good quotation only acquire its power when attributed to Abraham Lincoln, William, William James, or Shakespeare? If we need the name or the fame of the sayer to validate the quotation, are we not abdicating our discrimination and choice? The only planet of choice suggests just how important our individual choice may be in the years to come for ourselves and for the universe. Neither do you have to, nor can you, decide now if the wisdom offered stands on its own merit nor are you able to determine whether the information contained in this book holds together as a reasonable hypo hypothesis until you have read it. Then make your choice. Read on. So it was a pleasure to read this whole book. It has got wonderful information about our planet, our origins. It was read by, well it was read by me, but it was written, transceived by Phyllis V. Schlemmer and her partners who were uh, notating and writing the answers uh, from the nine, or Tom, the council, uh, was Andrei J. Perharic and Sir John, Sir John Whitmore. So yes, I have them all on my channels, and I hope you have a beautiful day. I have COVID hair. I probably never go to the hairdresser again.